Hello and most welcome to 1107 and this is the last time with this holder because it's now broken it's been paying its dues been used for 1107 times and I think that's enough for that one I will make a short recap of what is being gained from Charles H. Cam and uh, then I will continue to end off with the last paragraph of Charles H. Cam and his a new perspective on Heraclitus. And I call this little commentary, I even titled it, took the liberty to give it the title, How One Can Clearly See How the Fire Is Ignored or Rather Misunderstood. Humans wants or human will is usually seen in normal discourse as a supplement, something extra or external to true reality, more fundamental or direct reality and not seldom is the human wanting uh, or willing something that is happening in time and space I can imagine you can see the problem there if you follow the, the series it's taking time uh, taking place in time And that, of course, obviously make human wants and wills and our inclination, the modus we have, something smaller and not as important. One could say that they are happenings within the cuboid, cuboid reality of the Cartesian three coordinates X, Y and Z. And this can be called a natural development of seeing time and space as external and that the happenings of this limited world are somehow explained from the outside <coughs> and this I could say is something indirectly indicated by the Miletians the archaea has its very internal and personal working from within it could and this is something that only Heraclitus realized. Become something that made it sort of self-supportive in a way. And self-functioning in lack of better words. And somehow seemingly in 99 cases of 100 or 9,999 cases of uh, 10,000 or I would say maybe in one case of a million it is quite all right but not in the last one with no need for a human mind or human will or human modus human inclinations all that we intimately connect with being human The stimmung or the modus, our attitude, our posture, somehow seem to be of no importance. And we got into that period already after the Iliad and the Odyssey, a tendency that object and subjects turned up where it before had, before had, had only been processes and verbs, something that Ian McKilchrist takes up in his book. The master and his emissary, he shows that from the Iliad and from the Odyssey, where verbs included everything, like the taste or uh, the color or the type of emotion or what you were going to do, including the object that you used, 
the verb could mean that, uh, explained in modern language, the want for having to be close to the one you love but still keep a distance and offer the person a flower. That could be one verb and it's also including the color of the flower. And what we do, did in modern times, as we did with Heraclitus, the misunderstanding, is to say that those objects and those subjects, those colors, those adjectives and predicates, they were included. That that's wrong, according to Heraclitus. The pre, what is before, the difference between summer and winter, day and night, have both of the contradictions have and much more it is the process from what they are stemming from where they are stemming and from what they are stemming both those two things they are extraordinarily important not to be forgotten from where or from what and there is a why here, and it's constantly a why here, a why that cannot be eradicated or sort of made smaller. Nor, this is very good. Or want to sort of saying that the, uh, the object, the subject, the predicate and the adjective was baked in. And we would do with the same thing even more so with the Hopi language. That tendency is the problem. Seeing that there is an equalizing, that they equal each other, that's the problem and nothing else. This is what uh, Rudolf Garcia refers to as nullification. And you can see here how there is a distance building up in time. One could say it's a mistake. It's a mistake in belief on where you should put the finger down and say this is reality. Should you put it after the fact, after the superposition has fallen or before? And in space, it is this distancing. And it, that's literal. You can think of polar knowledge as I sometimes call it. That's the generalization of contradictions. You can think of that as distance you can also think about that because that very narrow is a chiasma you can think of that as there being no space no leeway to move around And this want to see that there is baked in an object and a subject predicate and adju adjective, it's a mistake in time, which comes beforehand. Obviously the verb, it lies beforehand in time. And pointing to and saying, mm, from the, the beginning, already before the fact, 
that was established an object and that object you could predicate with different adjectives properties and so forth that is the enormous mistake it is after and it doesn't even have to come but making something that is derived fundamental I wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't you say that that is part of and parcel of what reductionist reductionism means means just that doing the mistake of thinking that things that are derived are the originals that the contradiction is the original the contradiction is itself a process and to say contradiction is a, an existence and a stain it's diminishing it and also taking away loads of other knowledge it's like thinking you can derive what whiteness is from blackness it's absurd and you cannot derive coldness if in from warmth or love if from hate it's absurd it's actually distasteful and of course you cannot derive eternal life from death it must be the before so that's the mistake in time so so to speak the mistake in space is to think that there is a distance and that distance is quite literal distance you put in your own body by diminishing what you are putting yourself into this sort of cubi cuboid space making it literally smaller more cramped less balanced less flexible less more into posture an attitude so the stimmung on the classical physics is not so much specific stimmung it's just the lack of flexibility i would say unflexible positioning not making room for flexibility other ways of being if we look at it this way the pre the thing that is before it is potentialities and to understand potentialities you need to be more open play with the potentialities compare that to the voice of the friend i mentioned many times before but it's a singularity that does not exclude plurality the same is true here it's not exclusion that makes things clearer it is the hidden factor so to speak the hidden in the pre that is potentialities that makes everything effective it's a process if the world is a potentialities and not of fixed ideas or fixed objects as in the sense of Aristotle if you yourself your mind your body is fixed if you have a fixation in mind and don't think of that in six psychological term I would say fixation on mind is that harsh thinking of either or uh, either or thinking is harsh by itself constantly asking questions based on contradictions and oppositions <coughs> you can also compare that to the Gibsonian notion of affordances where one can see that the moment one perceives when one is moving which is happening when I move about and see things that is supposed from a classical perspective not to be enough because somehow you can't derive from that motion it is insufficient information from the perspective of classical physics three-dimensional cube to move about because there you think about fixity and locatedness and existences Gibson said hogwash that's absolutely not true how could that be true from an evolutionary stance but also for a common sense stance or a 
thinking stance, I would say. Absolutely, no, no, impossible. It's just a simple impossible. In the affordances, it's a process, it's a moving world. And you move, you were made for movement. Nothing is static. Static is derived from movement. Yes, there is a possibility of things being static. <laughs> Uh, now, Mr. Chishibet. Attention, please, passengers, Andrea Ikikian, Okto, London Heathrow. Is Skyler Kosito Kosito Gate A79? You see the complexity as they were trying to transfer something that is working by mistaking what is first. That's a problem in time. It's also a problem in space to say that locatedness is not a process, it's fixated. That fixation is actually the same thing as a sort of generalized contradiction. To say that something is in a specific point is to say that it is not in the, all those other points. You see there is lurking about already there or knowledge or polarity or con knowledge by contradistinction it's like sitting down and saying I'm going to write something about biology and we let's start with a fruit for banana and say well I write about the banana and the rest of the book I will contradict the banana and make anti banana two and to banana three, four, five, six, and so forth. And that happens to some degree, but building a whole book on it, it, that's classical physical view in common people. So all this movement contains everything and vision has always worked. Why would a moving antelope not have sufficient information? It has to be calculation made inside the head of the antelope and why the head in the Newtonian Cartesian manner with fixed objects so it could calculate from where the tiger is coming, in which speed, which momentum, which direction and so forth. Does it make sense? No, it doesn't make any sense at all. We are in a privileged position. We are presently in 2022. We have the great pleasure of knowing this to be absolutely wrong. And of course, I couldn't have gone there before uh, this movement in neurology, but it's also making access to Heraclitus possible. Any static word, according to James J. Gibson, would be unnecessary, redundant, and an obstacle. And there is no motivation, as never ever in human history, been put an argument why you need this three-dimension cubeoid uh, staticness. And this, of course, is a whole philosophy and a thinking heritage for us. And movement became impossible. You can see how movement is impossible if you start with static world. And I would say that that's um, a reducto in absurdo. It's just, it's correct. And that goes to show there is something bad going on. But Parmenides said no movement is possible. Xenon said movement is not possible, movement is an illusion. Anaximander, Anaximenes, or at least almost all the Venetian philosophers of nature, the physicos, said that everything was static in some way or another. And that was the origin of empiricism. And since we acquired empiricism, we've been using uh, the empiricist idea for person and good 
Of course, it acquired even more fame than it deserved, much more. Everything circulated in the circlets, centers around this non-center, so to speak. Emptiness do not exist, according to Parmenides. That should make you think something is rotten in the country of Denmark. Empty space is a prerequisite for movement. So odd that so many of the philosophers had this horror of Acre, that the defied space. It needs to be empty for you need to move into something that is not the point where you are. Uh, the spot you are is filled. The next spot needs to be empty, otherwise you can't move. I think sometimes it could be well worth to think about Xenon, give him a further thought, and then you might realize that there is something lurking here, something that makes it ununderstandable. And it also takes out the want, the yearning to do something. And this is what Heraclitus points out. We can end up with an empty world where we involuntarily try to eradicate all will, all want, all inclinations, so to speak. Trying to eradicate one's own preferences and wanting. So, do think about this carefully. How can you derive anything of winter from summer? It's a special cant. What sort of take is that of reality? And how can you derive anything of life from death? You simply think for yourself. I believe in life, that's the absence of death, because I fear death. Don't you see a problem here? Massive problem. Unimaginably big problem. And not addressed by anyone else, bar Heraclitus. It's an enormous problem. What sort of life is that? Everything that contradicts death is life? Hmm. That's where we are now, and we don't realize that both stillness and movement is coming from something more encompassing, and that we cannot point to directly. By doing so, we diminish it. We put it into water like salt put to water, and it dissolves, turns into nothing. It cannot be clearer than in the words of Heraclitus. Summer and winter, day and night, and from a more human perspective, men and gods and men and slaves. And I think here it becomes more and more evident how indirectly and carefully Heraclitus proceeds to show that being too clear will make understanding impossible. Because we are looking for the before, not something that is after when a contradistinction between clear and muddy is already being made or between alatheia and thea and it also shows how contradictions are something that should not be generalized because that will diminish them as well that will put them in just the negating role and he dwells into the, what is negation what is this negating and it comes from the Venetians indirectly because they say 
water is the arche or they said air is the arche thereby excluding the rest you see the movement of exclusion that is where it starts <clears throat> And of course, this has connections to the whole, all on, and unwhole on, and making a sort of a contradiction between the two will put us in onto the spot once more. No contradictions are not generalizable in that way, and making them universal will diminish them severely and our understanding of the world. It is awful to think that you can sort of derive by contradict day and then you can find out about night somehow. But this is how we are inclined to think today. We think 10 minus is the absolute opposite of 10 plus. If you walk forward 100 meters, you come back. If you walk 100 meters in a regressive direction, something I use the climb bottle to show is not true about space. Exclusion always makes for less. Exclusion is a too quick a remedy to try to explain something or understand something. Explain and understand too quickly its exclusion. Maybe the end too, well most definitely the end too. So he uses the word the whole. Panda in a everything is one. Because that's that is before before you sort of establish a before and after. This is the process of doing it. You establish a before and after, and then you put the things in an after position and an before position. That is the very process. It is not like it existed the before and after from the beginning and then you were able to put before and after. No, this is also the building up of before and after. Like before and after was inherent in the nature of reality. Also indicted indirectly by the negations. And that makes it so hard. One needs to understand that before and after is not prime, prime it's not fundamental. <laughs> and this is summer and winter is also good because there is connection. For there to be a summer there must be winter also and that relation is not covered by the general contradiction contradistinction between the two, the general contradiction, because it shows more complex and interesting relationships, how the sleep or the winter makes it possible for flowers to blossom, and it needs to prepare the soil for the harvest, for the sowing and taking in of the harvest. Hmm. I think that maybe could be the one of the more interesting parts that Now I go to a new look at Heraclitus and 
it's 203, the second column. In a sense then, the soul also travels upward to the wisdom which is set apart from all else. Yet full insight into the steering of all things belongs to God and not to man. It is the thunderbolt of Zeus which pilots all and the wisdom of the steering is Zeus himself. Neither sleeping nor waking, neither erudition nor science can bring a human being to this state as a man. He will not be wise, but only a lover of wisdom, a philosophos. It is to this ardent search for insight into the divine unity of all things that the words of Heraclitus would summon the reader. It is such philosophia which constitutes for him true piety. And it is against such an insight that traditional piety is to be measured. It does not come off well, even the more austere temples and images reflect a gross ignorance of the true nature of deity, as Xenophanes has seen. But the orgiastic rites of the mysteries and the phallic cult and the man mandism of Dionysus are the reverse of holy. It is not drunkenness and frenzy which can prepare the soul for insight. Yet even in such superstition the knowing eye discerns the fabric of cosmic unity, the madness and obscenity of Dionysiac worship are, after all, more appropriate than one would suppose, for Dionysus is the same as Hades. The apotheosis of drink and sensuality is in reality the god of death, the daimon of the downward path of the soul to passion, pleasure and dissolution. It is therefore only fitting to honor the god of destruction with the symbols of debauch. Justice of lies will lay in hands of false witnesses and forgers of lie, lies, not in some mythical sense seen of judgment, but in a natural order of things, in the relentless course through world and elements of the everlasting fire, the sun that never sets. I think it could be important here to sort of think that after and before something that slowly develops or when we start to see that contraction or distraction the asthma or dialogos between before and after and we all of a sudden say that the before is the archaea so there is a double take that first archaea could be called something in space but the before it's the making of a con contradiction saying this is before I establish it, it becomes an esteem. It is mostly remarkable, I never thought about that before, uh, this is well worth good progress here, I'd say. Before is created from contradiction and use the contradiction as a tool, but don't let the tool used by the militians be something that turns against you, become established, wanting to be the before. And I would say this is an incredibly different way of expressing in the Christ, the master and the emissary, and saying that uh, it's the takeover of the before that is the same as the takeover of the right hemisphere. It should be 
emissary and not master. And here it is the before that tries to become master and command by establishing it before that later become the RK. And then we also say that the before of uh, that long verb in Hoppy, there is actually objects baked in there and predicates and adjectives and subject. That is the mistake. That is very hard to express directly. Even if I did it now, the realization only comes with hidden explanations and they need, most definitely need contradictions to be fully understandable. Let's continue. So one could say the creation of a before and an after and then taking in the position of the before that is the whole process. Well, it's not the whole process, but that's the essence of the process. That is how it begins and becomes more stabilized. It, this is the process of becoming clear. This is the process of establishment of something that can end up being nothing at all and it hides knowledge in another way not in the good sense of hiding it obfuscates, it blocks out and it, there is no word for what this is and I think this is what Heraclitus is pointing to there is no word for this it cannot clearly be pointed to because the very cl clarity will in the listener, in the reader, evoke the same thing. So it's a change of modus altogether and going into the pre. And I would say that is what makes Heraclitus so grand. That is his very special contribution to humanity. And in that case, in that aspects it's absolutely great. I do understand there is a revival coming of Heraclitus these days for good reasons. It rhymes with quantum mechanics, it rhymes with uh, the Gödel theorem of incompleteness, it makes every, everything more clear, understandable, but it's interesting at the same time. This thing that Heraclitus is pointing to, somehow it doesn't seem to come from anywhere. It's not an idea, it's not an ideology, it's something in a way more fundamental or before, maybe that's the word. But it's enormously fascinating, enormously. Uh, first time I heard Heraclitus in the words of Bert Yoga Jogson, a Swedish interpreter and a yoga teacher, Nothing of her case is sounded uh, even vaguely interesting. Some sort of uh, mad variety or a madman. And I think from Bet Yoga, Jogson's uh, perspective, he was just a madman, and madmen were fun somehow. Drug addicts or something like that. Heraclitus is nothing of the kind, not at all. It is amazing. Well, a revelation can come anytime. And it was well worth all the effort to get that revealing factor. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a very nice afternoon. And until next, bye-bye.